Hello, and welcome to Gratz College's first ever adult learning webinar series. My name is Lori Cohen, and I'm the director of non-credit adult learning programs at Gratz. We're delighted that you're joining us tonight for this webinar. And please make sure that your volume is turned on and up. You should see a black bar at the bottom of your screen. If you click on the chat button, which has the three dots, um, you'll be able to type in questions or comments for us. I'll see your que questions and I can ask Dr. Sandberg your questions at the end of the presentation. You can also adjust the size of your screens if you would like to. You can move the PowerPoint screen around and you can also adjust the size um, that you see me right now in this frame and that you'll see Dr. Sandberg as well. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ruth Sandberg. As many of you know, she's the Leonard and Ethel, Ethel Landau Professor of Rabbinics and also the Director of our Master of Arts degree program in Interfaith Leadership. Dr. Sandberg will be speaking about the Sistine Chapel today. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. I wanted to welcome everybody to the webinar. I love speaking about the Sistine Chapel because it's a, one of the greatest works of art that, uh, that has been created by a human being. And it is, um, it's got some very interesting uh, lesser known uh, images that I would like to share with you tonight. Certainly the Sistine Chapel is well known as um, the epitome of Christian art. But what I wanted to focus on tonight are the lesser known Jewish images and Jewish symbols that appear uh, throughout not only the Sistine ceiling, but also in, um, in, a, in the, the wall, the altar wall that um, Michelangelo also painted um, of the Last Judgment. So I hope that you will learn something new about the Sistine Chapel tonight. Before I go on, though, I do want to give a very brief warning that uh, this is Renaissance art, after all. And so there are going to be quite a few nude images, uh, nudes of uh, human figures. Um, and for those of you that are not familiar with Renaissance art, this is part of the Renaissance appreciation of the human form. So be forewarned that there will be some nudity. Um, also, uh, because this is a, essentially Christian art, it is permitted among Christian artists to portray the divine image. So there are going to be several images of God in this presentation as well, uh, which is unusual because Jews generally don't um, draw or depict the image of God. So those are the, just the little uh, introductions and warnings that I wanted to give you so that nothing will be uh, a big surprise as we go through the slides. So there we go. Okay, just waiting for the next slide. So who is Michelangelo and why are we talking about him tonight? Uh, Michelangelo's, actually his full name is Michelangelo Bonarotti. He was born in 1475 and died in 1564. And here are just a few uh, key facts about Michelangelo. He was an Italian sculptor, painter, architect, poet, uh, contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci. He is considered by many to be uh, one of the greatest living artists during his lifetime, one of the greatest artists of all time. He's viewed as the archetypal Renaissance man, and I think uh, that will become uh, more, uh, I'll explain that a little bit more when we talk about the significance of the Renaissance, but it essentially refers to someone who has mastered many different areas of human knowledge. He grew up in Florence, in Italy, during the High Renaissance. And this is, this is one of the things that always uh, amazes me about these great geniuses. Uh, this, the, the sculpture of the Pietà, he completed at the age of 24, and that's at the top of the slide. 
and his statue of David he completed when he was only age 29. So clearly that shows you uh, the, the brilliance of the man at a very young age. He painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling between 1508 and 1512 at the age of 37. So again, at least from my perspective, a very, very young age um, to create such a great masterpiece. His sculpture of Moses, which is shown at the bottom of the slide, was completed in 1515 at the age of 40. And um, we'll also, as I said, we'll talk about the Last Judgment. He went back to the Sistine Chapel uh, 30 years later and, and painted the Last Judgment and completed it at the age of 66. An incredibly prolific um, and great artist, um, just from these few facts that I've given you. So let's talk a little bit about the Renaissance and why it's so significant. Um, Michelangelo was actually very fortunate to live in the city of Florence during the time of the Renaissance. And the word Renaissance itself uh, means a rebirth or a renewal from French. And it really describes the renewed interest in the classical world that was overtaking Europe starting in Italy. And people began to investigate and appreciate uh, the contributions of the ancient, uh, ancient Greece and Rome, classical Greek philosophy, science, Plato, Aristotle. Uh, one of the most famous uh, statements uh, that was appreciated in the time of the Renaissance was that of the fifth century Greek philosopher Proterius, who said, man is the measure of all things. So there was this renewal of interest in the classical world, kind of symbolized here by a painting by Botticelli, just to give another artist um, some press here. Um, and so it's a, it's a time of humanism. It's a time of interest in science, philosophy. It's a period of time in which, especially in the town of Florence, that people are coming together and beginning to learn from each other. Um, and Florence was the perfect city in which to have the Renaissance take place. Uh, it was a wealthy town because of all the trade that it engaged in. The, the town itself was very cosmopolitan, and the people in the town were very independent-minded. Today, I think we might use the word progressive to refer to the, to the basic mood of the city. And the de' Medici family played a very great role in financing Florence and also in being great patrons of the arts. Uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, who was the grandson of Cosimo, and they're both, both of their portraits are shown here. Um, Lorenzo discovers Michelangelo in 1489 and essentially informally adopts him, takes him under his wing, has him live in his palace, uh, because Michelangelo came from a relatively poor family. And Lorenzo de' Medici saw the, 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 the sparks of genius in him and wanted to really um, educate him. So he gives him a, a wonderful Renaissance education. Um, during the time that the Medicis were so prominent in Florence, the Jews were also welcomed back into Florence. At one time, they were removed from Florence. They come back they begin to create, um, they have an influence in the city, and more and more Christians are interested in learning about Judaism, the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish interpretation of the Bible, and they're also very interested in Jewish mysticism. So all of this knowledge, this wealth of knowledge, is uh, handed over to Michelangelo, and he does study the Jewish interpretation of the Bible. He studies uh, rabbinic midrash, which is the interpret the Jew the rabbinic interpretation of the Bible, and he's uh, exposed to uh, really a, a Renaissance. That's what makes him a Renaissance man. He's exposed to a Renaissance education, and this creates somewhat of a dichotomy for Michelangelo because he's in this inclusionary humanistic city of Florence which is very different as he's going to find when he goes to Rome, which is very much a medieval Roman Catholic city um, that is somewhat exclusionary. In Florence, Jews and Christians are united. 
Rome sees the predominance of Christians over those of Jews. In Florence, Michelangelo is exposed to the concept of universalism and the unity of human beings. And in Rome, he encounters the, the, the triumphalism of the church and the belief of the church at that time that that was the only truth. So as we're going to see, the ideas of the Renaissance really deeply influence Michelangelo and his worldview. And that is going to um, be seen in the Sistine Chapel. So let's take a look next at the actual location of the Sistine Chapel and where it is in terms of Vatican City. So on the left side is a map of Vatican City and on the right is an actual photograph. Uh, and in the red circle is where the actual Sistine Chapel is. Um, Vatican City is the smallest official country in the world, yet it has the world's largest church. It has one of the world's largest museums. And between four and five million people visit the Sistine Chapel every year. It's a fantastic number of people that are exposed to the greatness of the chapel. But at the same time, it's currently causing a great deal of concern because the dirt and the sweat uh, that people bring into the Sistine Chapel um, have actually uh, created a problem because that, that, that moisture and the sweat and the dirt uh, affect the delicate nature of the Sistine Chapel itself. In 2012, there was a big celebration of the 500 years of the Sistine Chapel. And um, in the 1990s, the chapel was actually uh, went through a, a cleaning and a renovation, which is still very controversial to this day. But part of the result of that cleaning in the 1990s led to people being able to get up closer to the painting on the ceiling and to be able to discover things that have not been discovered uh, for centuries. So the original plan of the Sistine Chapel was that um, it was to it was based when it was originally constructed on the um, on the uh, outline and structure of Solomon's Temple. So um, I have a map of Solomon's Temple, the plan, the basic plan, and how it's so similar to what you see in the Sistine Chapel. Solomon's Temple is based, of course, on the biblical tabernacle, and that both the tabernacle and Solomon's Temple have three basic areas. And the same three areas are seen in uh, the Sistine Chapel. Um, the holiest place in the temple, of course, was the Holy of Holies, where the Ark was kept. And there was um, a, a, a tapestry hiding that from people's view, from the priest's view. And there's also a gate that within the Sistine Chapel that also attempts to kind of imitate um, that veil over the Holy of Holies. The Pope who wanted to um, redo this existing chapel was named Pope Sixtus IV. And Pope Sixtus uh, really wanted to um, get the best artists that he could to paint the chapel. And that is, of course, going to be Michelangelo. So the name Sistine Chapel comes from the Pope's name Sixtus, which is Latin for uh, something that is polished or shining. But he dies before the work can be concluded, and his nephew, who is the next Pope, uh, Pope Julius II, completes the Sistine Chapel. So why make the Sistine Chapel based on Solomon's Temple? Well, there's clearly a theological purpose behind this, and that is to demonstrate that the church is now the new temple, and that since the Jewish temple is no longer standing, the church is the new temple. Here's a picture of what the Sistine Chapel looked like before the ceiling was painted. Um, and it simply shows a ceiling with a, a, a field of stars in it as if it were the, the nighttime sky. 
So Julius II had a plan to have a big uh, painting of Jesus over the front door, blessing the entrance of the Pope. And there are 12 triangular areas uh, on the ceiling. And uh, he wanted to have Michelangelo paint each of the 12 apostles in each of those triangles. He also wanted the ceiling to be painted with biblical stories reinforcing that the Pope was specially ordained by God to rule the world. Well, Michelangelo, with his Renaissance education, was going to have none of that, and he and Pope Julius II got into a major uh, debate over what exactly was going to be painted on the Sistine ceiling. Michelangelo stuck to his guns and he persuaded the Pope that he should paint the ceiling based on his vision. And he decided with his somewhat unfortunate experiences at the, at the Vatican and seeing a lot of corruption around him, decided that he would use this as an opportunity to create a very subtle critique of what was going on in the church and to also foster the ideas of humanism that he had gained from his education. As we're going to see, the Sistine Chapel, the ceiling that we're going to look at first, is 95% images from Jewish tradition. The other 5% are pagan. There are no Christian images anywhere on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And unfortunately, since we're, 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 um, we're pressed for time, um, I'm not going to be able to talk to you much about the 5% of the pagan images, but trust me, they're, they're very interesting. Okay. So uh, here's a map that I'm going to keep referring to so that you understand where we're looking, um, where the art is that we're going to be looking at. So against the Pope's wishes, Michelangelo chose to depict the Jewish ancestors of Jesus instead of the 12 apostles and other Christian images. And these are all in what are called the lunettes or the half moons that are in blue on this picture. And we're, we're going to have time to only look at two of them. And we're going to look at the first person that Michelangelo puts up on the ceiling as part of the ancestry of Jesus. Um, and uh, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament both have um, these uh, the lineage of Jesus going all the way back to Abraham. But of course, there isn't room on the Sistine Chapel for all of them. So I'm just going to show you some examples of some of the Jewish ancestors of Jesus. So the very first one is Aminadav. And who is Aminadav? He, he's, the, he's the man on the left, and we have a woman uh, combing her hair on the right. Uh, Aminadav uh, had a daughter named Elisheba, and Elisheba was the wife of the priest Aaron. So Aminadav is the father-in-law of Aaron, the first priest. And um, one of the things that is very striking about this image is that when it was cleaned, people noticed something that was hidden under the dirt. You'll notice there's a circle on the side of Aminadav's robe that he's wearing. And that yellow circle is one of the images that is associated with the forced badges that Jews were required to wear to identify themselves as Jews so that they would be differentiated from the rest of the population. Um, and this was started um, in the, the 1200s by the church to uh, force Jews to be identified as Jews. Um, perhaps, as some uh, art historians are, have argued, perhaps Michelangelo is adding this symbol on purpose to remind the church of their mistreatment of Jews by making them wear these badges. Another thing I also want you to know, to notice, is uh, throughout the entire Sistine Chapel, in the ancestry of Jesus, wherever a male figure is shown, there is always a female figure. So some scholars have argued that 
when Michelangelo was introduced to Kabbalah, to Jewish mysticism, not only was he introduced to the idea of God having many different aspects, according to the Kabbalah, he has 10 different aspects or emanations, but these emanations are both male and female. And I've labeled them, some of them here for you to see, some of the aspects of God that are male and those that are female. So let's return to the Sistine Chapel. Let's look at the second uh, image of the ancestry of Jesus, which is the second one um, that's circled here for you to see. Okay, this is Salmon, Boaz, and Ovet. These, are, these names are from the Book of Ruth, chapter 4 in the Book of Ruth. And these are three of the ancestors of King David. Um, Ovad becomes the father of Jesse, who is the father of David. So you see the Davidic lineage. Um, Ruth is seen on the left here, and Boaz, who was much older than she was, is shown on the right. You'll notice the pose that Ruth is in holding her son Ovad. Um, it's very similar to the stylized Madonna and child images that we're used to seeing in Christian art. And Michelangelo is using that and instead making this an image uh, that is associated uh, with a Jewish mother and a Jewish child, um, but not associated in any way with Christianity. Okay. Another area, another aspect of the Sistine Chapel are these triangular shapes. There are eight triangles, triangle areas throughout the Sistine Chapel, and this one is circled um, on the upper right. Um, and each one here has the word family in it, and that is exactly what they are. They are family scenes connected with each of the ancestors of Jesus. And in each one, Michelangelo chose to depict a Jewish family scene with the mother as the prominent figure, almost as if he was recognizing that Jewish mothers are the, the source of strength for the survival of the Jewish people. Let me just give you an example of one of those. Um, this, is the, this is right above the slide we, we saw. Um, and this uh, shows a mother um, cutting with a pair of scissors, opening the hem on her mantle. Um, and it may refer to the fact that in the medieval period, Jews often had to sew their most precious belongings into their, um, into their garments or into their robes uh, in order to hide them from hostile outsiders. In this case, the mother is smiling softly and she's cutting open her, um, that fabric to take out uh, whatever was hidden in there, kind of symbolizing her safe um, arrival at her destination. And maybe some scholars have suggested this was, again, Michelangelo's subtle way of reminding Christians, uh, again, about the mistreatment of Jews, and that hopefully they will no longer have to hide their possessions. Okay. Michelangelo also chose to pick seven prophets from the Hebrew Bible and to have them take a prominent place among the ancestors of Jesus on the ceiling. Um, and the seven of them are, um, are all circled for you here, Isaiah, Daniel, Jonah, Zechariah, Joel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. So why did he pick the, this particular group out of a lot more Hebrew prophets? Um, there are at least 15 uh, Hebrew prophets, and he chose the, these particular seven. I'm just going to give you an example of four of these, and maybe you'll begin to see some of the themes emerging from the prophets that he chose to emphasize from the Hebrew Bible. Okay, well, looking at the particular prophets that he chose, some scholars believe that these are prophets that have the uh, basic theme of human unity and a sense of universal connection uh, of all human beings, which may be purposeful on, on Michelangelo's part in contrast to the church's insistence that Christianity is triumphant over the whole world. And I just have two 
well-known verses from the book of Zechariah or Zechariah, um, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. And the other one that's recited as part of Jewish ritual on that day, the Lord shall be one and his name shall be one. So this theme of universality, the theme that power is not the answer um, and that God is the God of all people and his name shall be one among all people. Um, it's probably not accidental that he chose to put the face of Julius II in this uh, image of Zechariah, maybe to kind of give a warning to the Pope that um, power is not what God wants, but devotion. Uh, the next prophet is Joel, and um, Joel uh, gives a, um, uh, has a very beautiful verse about God pouring out his spirit on all flesh. Both sons and daughters are going to prophesy, old men will dream dreams, and young men will see visions. Again, this is one of the outstanding verses from, from the prophet Joel. Uh, it's a universal prophecy at the end of time. It includes everyone, old, young, men, women, all flesh. Again, emphasizing the universal, uh, the universal message that, my, that uh, Michelangelo wants to get across. Same with the book of Daniel. Daniel describes at the end of the book the uh, resurrection of all the righteous. He doesn't differentiate between Israel and other people. This is for, this is for humanity as a whole. Um, and so you begin to see the, uh, the constant theme of everyone being together, humanity as a whole, possibly being expressed in the choices of the prophets uh, uh, that are in the Sistine Chapel. Now, get this. This picture of Jonah is the largest figure on the ceiling and the very last panel that uh, Michelangelo painted on the Sistine ceiling. And it's right above the altar area where the Pope um, conducts services and, uh, trans and, uh, and transmits the, the Eucharist, um, uh, Holy Communion. So why Jonah? Okay, well, the whole point of the book of Jonah, which is read on Yom Kippur, is to remind everyone that God judges the whole world. He wants everyone to repent, even Israel's enemies uh, in Nineveh, in, the, in Assyria, and that um, Jonah cannot pick and choose who gets to be viewed as repentant in the eyes of God and has to learn that lesson. And just as God cares about um, the, the, the people of, of Nineveh, who are Israel's enemies, Jonah has to as well. So this universal theme is everywhere um, among the prophets on the Sistine ceiling. Also notice that um, Michelangelo read his Hebrew Bible well, because notice what is with Jonah. It is not a whale. It is a large fish. And that is what the Hebrew says. Let me just say a word or two about the very, uh, the very center piece, the middle piece that's in red here. Um, instead of, again, putting Christian images right smack in the middle of the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo chose to put images about creation, the universal experience of creation and the creation of human beings, not just Christian images. Here is uh, God separating the light from darkness. Um, on the first day of creation. Just notice the colors, because we're going to talk about this a little bit here. He's wearing a kind of purple-pink robe, um, and you can see his a, a very unusual image of looking up underneath uh, the, the beard of God. Well, let's look at the creation of humanity, of, of first of Adam. Um, God is wearing something a little different here. This is white. He's wearing a, a different kind of robe. Uh, and look somewhat different from the previous picture. So some people have suggested that uh, Michelangelo got the concept of God having different forms and appearing in different ways from rabbinic midrash. There is a midrash which said that when God revealed himself um, at the Red Sea, um, he appeared as a warrior. 
When he was at Mount Sinai, he appeared as an elderly sage full of compassion. And after the Israelites repented of the sin of the golden calf, he appeared as a congregational reader with a talit on, instructing Israel how to pray and repent. So maybe uh, Michelangelo feels comfortable showing God in these different aspects because of his exposure to the rabbinic interpretation of the Bible. Okay, let's look at the very center image, which uh, is uh, it pointed out in red here, and that is the creation of Eve. Eve gets the very center spot of the entire ceiling. And again, God, now God's wearing something that's sort of grayish purple, and he has more of a kind of a yellow beard rather than a white beard. And notice the arm gesture, Eve is forming a V-shape with her arms, and God is kind of forming a V-shape with his arm. Um, so he appears in a different way with each aspect of creation, very similar to the rabbinic view. Notice Eve is emerging out of Adam's side, not necessarily from one of his ribs. Uh, there is a rabbinic midrash which says that Eve emerged from Adam's side and not from his rib. So we don't know if this is in fact, um, if this comes from Midrash or not. It might. And this is a, a close up showing you um, a little bit better how she's not in any way associated with his ribs, which are more in the front, but almost with his back in a way. Um, maybe coming from, uh, influenced by that Midrash. Uh, there's some really interesting Jewish uh, Jewish images uh, in the temptation and expulsion from Eden as well. Um, Michelangelo chose not to show the typical Eve as the temptress, but he shows both Adam and Eve kind of sharing in the transgression together. Um, Adam is just as actively involved in picking fruit from the tree as Eve is. And if you notice what's in the red circle, it is not an apple. According to the rabbinic interpretation of the Genesis story, it was a fig, which they, which they ate, um, not an apple. Uh, also, the Midrash says that the serpent originally had arms and legs, and you see the serpent here, half human body and half serpent, um, which also may come from out of rabbinic Midrash as well. Michelangelo also has uh, four um, additional biblical images that he has in the four corners, and these are all uh, in black squares. Uh, on the map, and we're going to look briefly at those. Um, these are each in those corners. Each one of these stories details an occasion when Jewish survival was threatened and Jews were able to overcome those threats. And you'll notice there are two males that are the heroes and two females that are the heroes. Um, there's the story of Moses and the copper serpent from Numbers 21, when the people complain against God that they're tired of eating manna. God sends fiery servants, serpents to bite them, and then Moses intercedes on their behalf, and, and, uh, and God uh, tells Moses to make a, a figure of a fiery serpent, and when people look at it, they'll repent and remember God, and they'll be healed. Uh, the David and Goliath story is well known, now, it's very interesting what a detail Michelangelo chose about this story. He chose to emphasize the verse which states that David used Goliath's own sword to cut off Goliath's head. Um, then there is a, an image from the book of Esther, and during which Haman is kind of impaled um, on a pole, and you'll notice there's kind of a subtle cross underneath the feet of Haman. Um, some people have suggested that maybe what Michelangelo was very subtly saying here is Haman was the enemy of the Jews who got put on a, quote, cross, not Jesus. 
we don't know for certain if, but that's a very interesting image there. And the last is from the Apocrypha, which is uh, from the, the Greek, ancient Greek uh, Jewish Bible. Uh, it's not in the Hebrew Bible, but it shows the, uh, the point at which Judith cuts off the head of Holofernes, who is the Assyrian general who is uh, threatening uh, the Jewish people, and she is walking out with his head on a giant platter. So maybe Michelangelo is saying that um, you can't destroy the Jews, they will continue to survive. Another thing that people have pointed out is the placement of the chronological stories. The chronology of the Jewish ancestors of Jesus move from right to left, both at the top and at the bottom. And the middle images of the story of creation, of the world, Adam and Eve, and then of the flood and the Noah story, which we don't have time to get to, they're all in a certain direction. And if you know the old adage, Hebrew moves from right to left, <laughs> that's how we painted the Sistine Chapel. Latin and Italian go from left to right. So was it intentional that Michelangelo chose to paint everything in the Hebrew method, which is from right to left? There is even some Hebrew um, in the image of Jeremiah. And I blew it up because it's really hard to see it. It's very, very small. There's a little scroll next to Jeremiah, which has the word Aleph spelled out in English letters or in uh, Latin letters. And next to it, is, there appears to be the Hebrew letter Ayin. So some um, enterprising scholar decided to do a search of what is the connection between the, the Aleph and the Ayan. And believe it or not, there's a passage in the Talmud which says that in order for a priest to be qualified, he has to be able to differentiate between the pronunciation of the letter Aleph and the letter Ayan. There, there's a very subtle difference between those two. Maybe Michelangelo is poking fun at Julius II by saying that he is really a disqualified priest because he doesn't know enough to know the difference between these two letters. Some people even say that there are Hebrew letters hidden in some of the figures that David forms the letter Gimel, which is in Kabbalah is associated with um, the word associated with power and that Ju the Judith and her servant formed the letter Chet, which um, is connected with Chesed, which is a female aspect in Kabbalah. Um, there is, may be some Hebrew letters hidden in, um, the, in the picture of Jonah. This one's a little harder to make out, but um, the theory is that his two legs formed the letter hay and the little loincloth that is wearing represents that little separation in the in the letter hay in hebrew and he's got these weird hand gestures over to the side um this is not a normal way of holding your hands so some people have suggested that maybe his hands are forming the letter bet so what would be significant about the letter hey and the letter bet? Well, the letter hey, of course, is symbolic of um, the number five, maybe a reference to the five books of the Torah. And for those of you who know some Hebrew, the letter bet is the very first letter of the, of the Torah. So is he giving a kind of subtle addition to his emphasis on Jonah symbolizing the universality of of the, of, of, of the human connectedness? And is he also reminding his fellow Christians that Christianity and its scripture is based on Jewish scripture, on the Torah and the Hebrew Bible? Okay, now we're gonna end up by just looking at a few last images from the last judgment, which Michelangelo painted, painted 30 years later on the far wall of the Sistine Chapel. The Last Judgment depicts the, the second coming of Jesus and, at the, and the bringing the final judgment for all humanity at the end of time. And the whole work shows 
um, the righteous rising to heaven and the wicked descending into hell. There are over 300 figures um, in uh, this uh, depiction of the Last Judgment. It's the largest depiction of the Last Judgment in the world. Um, and it's the largest fresco ever painted by one individual. So, I'm very interested in looking at the very center of the heavenly realm here, where the, the red rectangle is shown, depicting who are the select people who get to be in the literally in the inner circle around Michelangelo and uh, his mother Mary. So let's take a look at some of these people. Okay. So the first image is showing St. Peter, who is one of the key saints in Christianity, who holds the keys to the kingdom, that is to the kingdom of God. And right next to St. Peter is, guess who? Moses. So this is very unusual to find a depiction of the heavenly realm showing not only Christian saints, but to show ancient Jews and Israelites from the Hebrew Bible who also get to be in the inner circle. So it's astounding that Moses is so prominent. And unfortunately, I, I had to cut off the image to blow up the face of Moses. But actually, St. Paul, who is equally as important as St. Peter, um, is kind of standing off to the side, way behind Moses. So even St. Paul doesn't have the prominence that Moses has um, in this particular um, part of the Sistine Chapel. Let me show you some other Jews that are prominent in heaven. Um, the image of Abraham is shown with his long white beard, and he's standing next to Isaac, who is standing next to Jacob and Esau. And Jacob and Esau are coming together to give each other a kiss of reconciliation and forgiveness. Um, perhaps the, the reason why Jacob is shown with a lot of his and, uh, bare skin showing was to show that he was the smooth son and Esau is the one who clearly has much more hair. And also there appears to be some red hair on his back if you look at the image. And next to them are Cain and Abel who are also um, um, in an embrace and in a kiss. Um, I don't want to get too involved in this, but there is some uh, quite a bit of evidence that Michelangelo was gay. And some people have also suggested that part of the reason why these pictures of young men kissing each other are included in the heavenly realm is maybe a subtle way of Michelangelo saying that people that are gay also deserve to be in heaven. But that is, again, this is very, a lot of conjecture. Um, so we don't really know if that was his intention. Okay, we're almost done here. Um, there's another part of the heavenly realm which shows Joseph, um, as well as King Solomon, and even the Queen of Sheba. And the Queen of Sheba is not even an Israelite. She's not a Jew. She's a foreigner who comes to visit King Solomon. And Michelangelo wants to give her a place in heaven as well. So he's talking about the universal image. These images are incredible of the variety of people that he has in heaven. Um, the figure of David also appears. Um, um, he's on a different side. He's on the side with Mary, but King David is also shown. The last image that I wanted to share with you is um, figures that are a little hard to see. So I, again, they're a little blurry because I had to blow them up. But this is an even more striking image in this last slide. There's an angel, if you look at the large picture, there's an angel pointing to two figures. So who are those two figures? They're actually two traditional Jews dressed in traditional Jewish dress. 
um, one is in European dress and the other is Oriental dress. So that what Michelangelo is saying is not only were these worthy figures from the Hebrew Bible deserving to be in heaven with the Christians, but Jews in his own day also have a place in heaven. So I, I have to conclude my talk now, but I hope that you enjoyed this brief look at Michelangelo's masterpiece of the Sistine Chapel. And as one of the most powerful works from the medieval period that shows that there are people who saw harmony and acceptance between Jews and Christians. And this is a message that I think is still of very great relevance to all of us today. Thank you. And I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Sandberg. Uh, this is Lori again. I think Lori has to turn her sound on. Yeah, okay. Okay. Sound, okay? okay, go ahead, Lori. Can everyone hear me now? Great. Yeah, okay. Um, so, Dr. Sandberg, thank you. This has been a really fascinating journey through the Sistine Chapel. I mean, thank you. I've been, thank I, have, you. I love it. Yes. Every time I show it, I love it. <laughs> I have been so intrigued by it. I, yeah. I've really learned a lot tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming in. I'm happy to ask you. Okay. Um, one of our commenters said, wow, this is a magnificent presentation. Mm -hmm. um, and she would also like to know how, from what sources did you use to all your research for oh, this? Yeah. Well, this is a great question. Um, once the Sistine Chapel was cleaned in the 1990s and people were actually able to climb up on the scaffolding and they could actually see these images up close and they and all the centuries of dirt and and wax from candlelight um, and dust and you know pieces of you know human human uh, people walking in and out and leaving, you know, little microscopic pieces everywhere. Um, once they cleaned it, they started to have a very different understanding of these images. And um, the two people who started this whole study um, eventually wrote a book called The Sistine Secrets. Uh, one is the two authors, one is Rabbi Benjamin, um, Benjamin Black who is a uh, professor of Talmud at, at uh, Yeshiva University, or at least he was when he wrote the book. And the other is an art historian, also a Jew, an Orthodox Jew, named Roy Doliner. And they are the, the authors who, um, uh, who wrote this book together. Roy is a really interesting character. Um, he's the first Orthodox Jew that um, became a docent uh, by the Vatican to give people tours of the various museums, including the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican, and to kind of give a Jewish interpretation of the art so that people would appreciate not only the Christian imagery, but the Jewish imagery as well. So he did, they both did a lot of research. Um, and I, there were a whole lot of articles that I read about, um, there's been a whole interest in, among art historians in looking at medieval and Renaissance art for secret images. Um, and it, it kind of became super popular, you know, with the uh, Dan Brown books, um, uh, uh, you know, about um, uh, images and art and secret, um, secret messages. Um, but this is really a very serious undertaking by serious art historians. Um, and so they began to discover a lot of, of, of the images saying more than just what they represent physically. Um, so I read a lot about uh, interest in these secret Hebrew letters as well. But if people want to start with a, with a good source uh, for that information, the Sistine Secrets is a good place to start because it, it's written by Jews who are looking at the Sistine Chapel from a Jewish perspective. Thank Another? you. Thank you for that um, yeah. thorough Another answer. Question? Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, there's a follow-up question about, okay. the, about the last slide that you showed. Uh -huh. um, the question is, there were two, um, it was a slide of two bearded Jews in heaven. Are we, are we, yes. are we remembering? Mm -hmm. So could they be a Jew and a Muslim? That I'm not sure about. I know that the, the art historians who have looked at those images up close identify what they're wearing as headgear as what would be typical for Jews 
during this period of time, both in Europe and, um, and in the Near East. Uh, so most people would have identified them as Jews. Could the other figure be a Muslim? It's possible, um, but I don't know. When, I'm, 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 let me do a disclaimer. <laughs> I'm not an art historian. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I look at these things from the history of, of, of uh, from the perspective of Judaism. So um, I would have to investigate it more to see if it's possible for that figure to be a Muslim. It's an interesting question. I don't know. Yeah, but uh, generally they have been interpreted as Jews. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I also have kind of a, a goofy question here. Mm -hmm. There's oh, kind of, is this the one that I always get? <laughs> well, let me see. Go ahead. All right. Well, maybe you already know it. Okay. Um, so I've kind of heard rumors that Michelangelo may have painted the Sistine Chapel while on his back. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I get that asked a lot. I wanted to make sure that I got this right when I started teaching this material several years ago. No, he did not paint the Sistine Chapel on his back. Actually, it's worse than painting on your back, because if you paint on your back, at least your back is supported. Um, he had to paint in these really awful, torted uh, positions. and. There is a story now. I don't remember if this is apocryphal or if this is if this is real. If it, if it can be documented, that at one point he got so disgusted with these contorted positions he had a pain and that he just got into a fit and walked out. And they had to go looking for him in Rome, and he wanted to go back to Florence, and he was sick of the whole thing. Um, but part of because he was in these very contorted positions and he was working in this very detailed work, um, very up, you know, up close for four years in a row with almost no breaks. Um, we do know from some of his letters that he complained of things that today we would identify as scoliosis or rheumatism. And apparently he suffered from kidney, kidney stones also um, from the staying in the wrong position. It must have been a, a just incredibly torturous work. So, it, yeah. yeah, but he didn't paint it on his back. No. It no. sounds like he needed a physical therapist after yeah, that, exactly. and a massage, exactly. massage therapist yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. um, so some of these um, insights have been brought to light more recently, in, in more recent mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. So there, the, I don't know. I'm wondering, mm -hmm. was there any blowback from the Vatican? How do they feel about this oh. whole idea of all of these uh, Jewish yeah. aspects to the Sistine yeah, Chapel? That's a, that's a really interesting question. Fortunately. The Roman Catholic Church has made incredible strides in renewing and, uh, its relationship with, with Judaism and between Catholics and Jews. And probably uh, the Catholic Church has just been starting in the 1960s with Vatican II and the desire to, uh, one of the documents that came out of Vatican II was a document saying we need to reconcile with Jews and we need to come to grips with the, the hostility antagonism between Jews and Christians for thousands of years. And um, the popes have welcomed this new way of understanding the Sistine Chapel because they want Christians to understand Judaism even more because there's there's an acceptance now of the Jewishness of Jesus, an acceptance of how much of Judaism got incorporated into early Christianity, and how much the Roman Catholic Church wants Jews and Christians to see each other as friends and allies. Thank you, Dr. Thank Sandberg. You. Thank, Thank you. you. I Thank appreciate you. all of your time you. with all of these questions. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, as I've said, it's really been a fascinating presentation. Um, I've learned a, a, quite a bit about the Sistine Chapel tonight, just as I know that you have. I wonder some of these um, ideas that scholars have brought up. I, I wonder, in some cases, it seems like they're looking for things, and in other cases, I think they're really they're really onto something. And I invite uh, any comments in our chat section from anyone who would like to discuss that. 
um, offline. We certainly invite it. Um, and af after this program, you'll receive a link to this program um, through your email after the Memorial Day weekend. And I want to tell you about next month. So next month on Tuesday, June 18th is when Dr. Joseph Davis, he's our Associate Professor of Jewish Studies, um, he'll discuss what he calls Right Bible, Left Bible. It's two approaches to the Bible in the contemporary Jewish community. Uh, what does he mean by this? I'm going to read this to you so we can get a good idea about it. Um, in the webinar, Dr. Davis, he is an ex expert on the Bible and Judaism. He'll discuss uh, contrasting approaches of conservatism and progressive Jews today. Uh, one sometimes hears that, hears that Orthodox Jews um, and political conservatives interpret the Bible literally, so that's one way, uh, whereas progressive Jews approach it non-literally. And he's saying, well, that may or may not be true. And in fact, it probably isn't true. So each side is, has much more complex, and it is, uh, in the end, much more interesting to the question of the Bible and its meaning today. So I look forward to his presentation. And again, that is on Tuesday evening, June 18th. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Have a good night.